Hey, it's Freiberger here from Roadkill. I am quarantining pretty hardcore. Staying in my garage, getting some stuff done. I hope you are too. And man, I hope this thing ends soon so we can get back to racing. Hi everyone, I'm Ira Gabriel from SEMA. I listen to the Aftermarket Insider Podcast with Joe Sebergandia. Look forward to seeing you at the races and I'll see you at the SEMA show. Everybody be safe and wash your hands. Driving directions on your phone? Oh no! That's not fun. Navigate hands-free with Apple CarPlay. Hey, hey everybody, welcome to the Aftermarket Insider. This is season one, episode seven. I'm your host, Joe Sebergandio, and this is your podcast for the last week of May. We've got a great podcast in store for you tonight. We've got the man in black, Bud Brutzpin, the man who created automotive television, both film and TV as we know it today. Uh, I want to begin by thanking our sponsors, Pioneer Electronics. You know, Pioneer is the global leader in car electronics and a proud supporter of automotive events and enthusiasts everywhere. You know, no matter what you drive, Pioneer is the gear to upgrade your ride to sound better and to connect with the latest technology like Bluetooth, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and new for 2020, Amazon Alexa. Remember, don't break up with your car, upgrade it with Pioneer Car Electronics. Hey, everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you had a great Memorial Day weekend. We were just hanging out by the pool, me and Linda, and uh, it was a nice weekend. Uh, there seems to be a little uptick from what I can hear. Uh, I hear folks from the NFL talking about starting football games. I watched another NASCAR race without fans recently. NHL is talking about maybe opening up NBA, maybe all playing in Orlando. So this uptick is uh, good stuff. It's good for the soul because I think everybody's getting to that point where they just want to get back to some sense of normalcy. So today's podcast is uh, one that I've been looking forward to over the weekend. When you talk about automotive programming, uh, there are few folks that pop up as often as Bud Brutzman. Uh, Bud started as a producer back in the early 90s and uh, is not only the producer, but also a creator and CEO of many automotive shows that you've probably been watching over the last decade, including overhauling uh, one of my favorites uh, rides uh, hot rod TV uh, there's a, a myriad of other events that Bud's a part of in television shows many don't realize that Bud was one of the main guys behind King of the Cage uh, other of the shows include American Trucker uh, the Fixers and an RV show that I dig because I got a small little camper myself he's involved in a variety of television and film programming he has been a part of some events that are staples that uh, you may have seen, including the overhaul in studio that took place at the SEMA show, the score uh, in Baja Center, which was out in front of the South Hall where they actually had qualifying for score there. Uh, he came up with and helped create the SEMA stage that uh, is outside and now a part of the very popular makeup that takes place at the SEMA show. Bud's footprint is on most of it. I met Bud back in the, I want to say 2005, while I was working with Peter McGillivray from the SEMA show. And from that day on, he's been a guy that I've looked up to. He's been a guy that I appreciate because he blazes his own path. He says what's on his mind. And with that said, let's bring him onto the podcast. Welcome, Bud. How you doing, brother? What's happening, Joe? What's going on? Well, um, we're uh, hopefully heading into a fruitful month of June. Uh, May was a little bit of a challenge for most of us. Uh, we, we started to get primed for hopefully this uptick uh, just by hanging out uh, by the pool, as I mentioned earlier. How was your Memorial Day holiday? What did you do? Uh, it was awesome. I, I'm doing some outdoor lighting. I grilled some steaks for my son and my wife and I. We hung out. I went on a seven mile hike with a with weight on me up hills. I was just, you know, just training, kind of trying to be healthy, shot a bunch of baskets. I had a great Memorial weekend. Um, but I think it is an uptick. The stock market's at uh, 25,133, which is banging right now. So that's good. 
Yeah, uh, well, uh, I, I think there's what's a, a silver lining. Some folks didn't want to hear about a silver lining when all this was going down. They, they, they thought it was the end of life as they knew it. But, um, you know, here we are two months into this thing and there is light at the end of the tunnel. I'm, I'm kind of over the doom and gloom, aren't you? Yeah, I'm not really a doom and gloom kind of guy. I mean, I think if uh, it, there was, there was a, an interesting meme that went around, which is like, if your life hasn't changed that much during the quarantine, the pandemic, you're kind of a, uh, an asshole anyhow. I do nothing but hang out with my house. Now I have more time to hang out of my house. I go from work to the office. I don't really go out to dinner that much. So my life hasn't changed that much because I go to work. I mean, I'm not traveling internationally. I do a lot of international travel, so I don't really travel internationally anymore. Um, but hopefully that'll pick up soon. But I really just uh, I go home, chill out with my family. I come to the office and that's it. So, I mean, it really hasn't, uh, there's been a lot of, a lot of things that's changed, but you know, it's, it's been technically good for me. Yeah, you know, I, I too, and I think I'm fortunate that I found what was important to me way before the pandemic. And largely at this point, it is being home. It is being with my family. It is being with a smaller circle. Uh, I'm not really one that's going to like go meet you out at the bar and have drinks. I'm, that's, not, that's not my deal. I'd much rather just be hanging out. Um, in terms of the, the travel, how do you do it? Like I saw you, the last time I saw you was Saudi Arabia, I believe... You were, I don't know, were you going to, you came right back? Did you go to Cambodia or somewhere after that? Where, where did you? I was in Cambodia before that. Yeah, I was in Cambodia right before that, which is crazy. Um, last year, um, last year I did, I'll try to remember, I, I did 176 flights, 68 cities and 25 countries. So uh, I was in China a lot the past couple of weeks or the past couple, I was in China last year, I was in China three times. It was in Cambodia. Uh, Australia. Yeah, I did. A, I did a lot uh, right towards the end. Um, yeah, right towards the end was uh, was Saudi Arabia. But yeah, and all, all the way through all last year for like 15 months straight, all they did was travel. I've been traveling for a while. And last year, I put on my travel shoes again, and was working with not only Ira and the Young Guns program, but also Bonnie Air events. And by the time I got to Saudi Arabia, and saw you there, I was, I was kind of done. I was, you know, I, I, I didn't see myself being able to do much more that year. It was November. How do you maintain that uptick? How do you maintain um, being on point? Doesn't all of this just get too much for even a guy like you? No, I, I have my routine when I travel. So as long as I can sleep on the plane and I get off the plane, I'll go work out and I keep myself healthy. It, I think it really has to do with what you're doing, like what you're doing, what we did inside of radio, which is opening up the, uh, the aftermarket, opening up the world. I mean, I appreciate and love what I do. I do television, I'm building events. Uh, in, in one of my shows, like in Cambodia, we're, in Cambodia, we're saving lives. Um, I have a television show. We kind of go around the world and we, we build infrastructure and wells and hospitals and children's hospitals and recycling centers for, uh, you know, underprivileged people. So it really, if you love what you do, you kind of fall in the routine. Um, the only thing that's unfortunate about the pandemic is I, yeah, I kind of get to see what I miss. Like I'm home every weekend now with my family and it's awesome shooting baskets in the pool with my kid and going, doing some, you know, honeydews. And like, I've rebuilt my house like three times in the past month. And a half. <laughs> like I'm paint shit and doing stuff and installing lights. It's, it's amazing. Like week after week after week. Yeah. There, uh, you know, look, if you wanted to learn how to play the tuba, go play the tuba. Yep. Uh, if you are bored out of your mind and you're sitting around waiting for unemployment, go get a job stock in shelves. By the time you get unemployment, you can quit the job stock in shelves. I mean, just do something right. And I found myself doing the same thing. My, my, uh, my residence isn't as large as yours. So I'm, so I'm sure that most of my to-do list and honey-do lists got taken care of quicker, but I'm ready to get back in it. We talked about the Saudi show. And before we get into too, too much, what was your final takeaway from that Saudi experience? I had a great time. I loved it. I thought it was great. And my, my wife went, my son went, um, I had an opportunity to sit down with, uh, the, with Faisal, who's the head of the GEA and I had dinner with them and I had dinner with the, the ambassador, um, at, at that really, really cool little pop-up sushi restaurant that was in the middle of there. Um, I thought Bonnier events did an amazing job. I think they, the Saudis were happy. Um, I, I really appreciate what they're trying to do with the culture over there in their 2030. I think it's a super smart thing to bring in tourism and, and uh, aftermarket and cars. I mean, it's a long way. They got to be educated because I think we found out they don't love muscle cars as much as we thought they did. Um, but 
I thought the event was for, for, and I remember it very well when they were sending us videos for an empty parking lot, an empty military base parking lot, you know, two months ago, and all of a sudden it pops up into this amazing event. Um, I, I thought it was pretty cool. I liked it. Yes, I, um, I agree that um, many of the folks that I had the, time, uh, the chance to spend some time with, you know, they didn't have automotive in their blood. Their, their fathers didn't have cars. There were no toolboxes. Their grandfathers weren't car racers. So the young folks that we talked to, I just found that they had an interest, but they had, they had nothing to fall back on. So we were pioneering that. And I, I do believe we planted some good seeds. Uh, the spirit of the event, particularly those that joined us, Bud, you know, uh, for those of you who are viewing the program, you know, Bud was there in a variety of capacities as he always is. In fact, Bud, you were probably one of the first persons that got the phone call from Peter and Jonathan when this Saudi deal came up. I remember meeting with you at the Ritz in Pasadena almost this time last year in May when we had breakfast and we're finalizing things. Uh, it was a quite a hectic time from May to November, if I recall after that breakfast. And to your point, the Bonnier guys did a, a really good job. What did you find yourself mainly uh, tasked with for that event? Well, I mean, it, we, Peter and I started in February. He called me <clears throat> in February. I won't tell too many details. He said he's going to have a meeting with the Crown Prince uh, and the people from the GEA down in Beverly Hills. Will I go with him? So myself and Ryan Fingley House and West Coast Customs went down there on like a Friday or Saturday, we met with like 15 people in this conference room, talked to them. And then Peter flew back to uh, Boston. And then the crown prince called and said he wants to meet again on Sunday night. It was like Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday night, he wants to meet again. Peter flew back to his family. So he calls Ryan and I said, you go back there and do a photo op with the crown prince. So Ryan and I got in his Rolls Royce, we drove down to Beverly Hills, met with the crown prince, shook hands, literally shook hands and signed a deal. And I called Peter. I'm like, well, I just signed a piece of paper. And, um, and we took a photo with the crown prince. I think we have a deal. I, sw <laughs> I swear it was Ryan. And I just sat and looked at it. I'm like, I think we, it was like 10 minutes. I think we just got signed a deal for Peter. I don't know what it was. Um, it was pretty uh, funny, but that, you know, that I don't care. This is my capacity. It's what I do. I, I show, I show really well. And you asked me to show up and go, go to get a deal. I'll go do it. So yeah, we were involved early on um a lot of we were involved a lot of the celebrity a lot of the media part of it um much like you getting vendors and getting people uh interested in going uh i knew the parameters of the deal we all kind of talked about the parameters of the deal and bringing people in we did a lot of media we started chaos mix uh we started doing a, a, a kind of a prequel of videos going out ahead of it because we have to kind of socialize the idea and get it out there what's happening <clears throat> so i convinced bonnier early on that there has to be a social component to it you can't just all of a sudden pop up in saudi arabia so um that we did i don't know hundreds of videos to put out and, and including the, or the very first one that i did and i think that you know it's a weird society i think people understand it when when a video comes out it starts to become real so we did this really cool opening video about how, how the, the show is going to start in saudi arabia and that, i think for a lot of people that made a difference yeah that was um those were little nice little opportunities for folks to get a an inside view on what was going to be happening. Uh, thank you, incidentally, for shining a little light on this mini bike scene and uh, having me on one of those. But the uh, the Saudi event has come and gone, and you know now it's May. When we started the podcast a couple of months back, a lot of it was uh, based around the fact that you know there was a little bit of uncertainty going on, not only with uh, our livelihood within our lives, but also selfishly. You know, you focus in on what's upcoming. And we were just beginning to mount our focus on our automotive events and everything just got blurry. Uh, as a result, we had Tom Gattuso on the first podcast to talk about the importance and the reality of the SEMA show happening. Uh, talk a little bit about your take on the upcoming SEMA show. Uh, if in fact you think it's going to be a go and what, what goes on in your mind when people start to talk about the SEMA show in this year. So I think the SEMA show is going to be good this year. I, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of pent up demand, um, a lot of people wanting to go out. I look at the, you look at the sign up from all the people that have been signing up and locked in their booths. I mean, listen, the world is still going to turn, right? We cannot, we're not going to shelter in place and hide from a, a microorganism for the rest of our life. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about our industry is our industry is a, is a weird industry. 
I think more people are starting projects, more people are doing projects. Uh, I look at my dad who's, you know, at home alone building a Mustang by himself. I mean, we're kind of, we're kind of alone anyhow. Social distancing and hot rodding go hand in hand. There's nothing better than getting in your convertible, driving down the coast all by yourself. Don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to do anything. You're just sitting there with your thoughts in your car and you're driving. Same thing with building. We, I early on had a great conversation with Iyer Gabriel at SEMA and I said, we have to start building this message to people. So we started a series which will launch this week. It might even launch today on SEMA's website. Uh, it's called Ready for Battle. What happens is Adrian from Overhaul and AJ, she shows up uh, and we do it in, in a, a social distancing matter with our, our production, but she calls almost every one of the top builders and has conversations with them, ask them how's business, how they've been holding out. And almost to a person, every shop is busy. Every shop is going, every shop is busy. You know, they're all practicing social distancing and they're all staying away and there's no, you know, high fiving. And, and you know, there's a lot, a lot of stuff in our life will be, where is going to change, but it's not going to stop. This is not the, you know, we, we're going to have to adapt to new things, but we're still going to be buying cars, still be driving cars. Um, and all the shops, you know, the Ring Brothers, Jeremiah Prophet, uh, the guys at the Roadster shop, you know, Kyle Tucker, all these guys that are a part of the Battle of the Builders, Adrian kind of drops into socially and asks him what's going on. So you got to check out the web, the web series because it's really, really cool. And, and what I did, you know, the day, the week after this happened, it all, whatever it was, March 13th or 14th, I just started, th you know, trying to figure out in, in like you did, like with new media, like what does this look like? All right, great. So we started uh, that series. I have another series I'm doing with a client, Opto Battery. Um, and it's called High Performance House Calls. We immediately, like three or four days into it, um, and you can look up on Optima's website right now. Um, I had Chris Jacobs, Jim McElvain, and also AJ start calling people and asking what are they doing? What are you doing? What are you working on? And, you know, there's some, 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 some staff members were gone in some of these shops, but they're all working on projects. They're all doing stuff. So did 20 episodes of this. We did another series I have called Fixers. So I immediately started to like, okay, you know, I'm not going to sit around there's only so many honeydews I can do. We're gonna, we got to start creating more media. What does new media look like? Um, and we, you know, we ended up doing I don't know, 40 or 50 of these webisodes uh, across the board. And, and, there, and by the way, it's interesting is that like the SEMA one's going to stick. We're going to continue to do it. it it's, a, it's an efficient way to start dropping in on people from people to see people shop. You'll, you'll see it. The Jeremiah Prof episode, I think, air, airs today. It drops today on SEMA's website. You know, but over your history, you've been able to do some things that had never been done. You've been able to turn uh, historically no's into yeses. Uh, I think back when we had first met, in fact, I remember it pretty clearly. I had just launched- You remember our fight? Well, you know we got in a fight, right? Well- I want to uh, see if you're going to tell the truth here. If not, I'm going to. It's kind of fun. Well, I, 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 <laughs> here's what I remember. I remember uh, starting- Motor Media and having a nice little agency in Glendale. And Peter called and said that he was uh, bringing over Bud Brutzman. And we were going to talk about doing some things at the SEMA show. And uh, we had a nice meeting. And I remember the topic had to do with the sponsorship potential for SEMA overhauling studio. We're going to, we're going to take overhauling and we're going to set it up at the SEMA show. And again, it just sounded like what uh, you had, what you taught me, and I, I think pissed off could have been one description, but what you taught me was that I may have been just a little bit too cautious. Uh, we were talking about potential partners and revenues, and you know, you you had you had plans for a multiple group of manufacturers being involved, hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue coming in, and I think we had like four or five month span. Well, to that point, I had only had a fraction of that revenue in for everything. And I was a little okay. bit concerned about our ability to bring in uh, more than a handful of guys and more than a handful of dollars. And you were like, that's not the right attitude. You, you, no, we, we, this thing's going to be as successful as we make it. It's going to be really successful because I fucking say so. And I remember when you left, uh, Peter and I spent some time talking and it's like, well, I don't what know. Asshole. I don't, I don't what know an if, asshole that guy is, right? I don't, I don't know if we could do this, Peter. I don't want to put my name on the line for a few hundred grand when I think we can only maybe do like 60, 70, 80 grand. And I'll tell you this. Um, I learned. I, I learned that if I think we can do $500,000, that's the only way we're going to be able to do it. If I don't think we're going to be able to do $500,000, we probably will never get there. 
that's what I remember learning the most about that meeting. And I got to tell you, and my memory is pretty clear on this. We did a few hundred grand, which was much more than I thought, not quite as much as you thought we would do, but much more than I thought we would do. And, and there, from that point on, bud, if like, if you said something was happening, something's happening. Dana says there's going to be fight Island. There's going to be fucking fight Island. If Bud Brutzman says that we're going to have the overhaul in studio, <laughs> we're going to have it. So you taught me that you, you taught me that with a positive attitude, you can get to where you want to go. Even if it does sound a little bit, you know, out of whack. Well, at the, uh, you know, you, I was sitting on a hit show at the time, right? So we had overhaul on and I knew how big it was. And what I wanted to do is bring it to a big stage. Um, if everything would happen, if everybody remembers what happened at the SEMA show with Peter McGilvin, myself and Joe is we were going to take the big plan was to do, and this is, this is true. Doesn't matter if you believe it or not, not you, but anybody else, but is the front parking lot of the SEMA show before you and I started in, you and I and Peter started in, I wanted to grow what we were doing. Right. And the idea that we proposed to you, we're going to take the front parking lot, which is really was like one mother's trailer was sitting out there and like a couple boats, and it was like overflow parking. Like that's all it was, it was overflow parking. And I remember I drew up that like, I'm gonna have this gigantic tent with a red carpet leading to the front door, and I'm gonna pack it with semis, and I'm gonna bring all my sponsors in there. And the response, cause you've never met me before, it just is like, there's no way. With five months, there's no way. People already have their budgets, not gonna park their rigs there, you're not gonna get extra money. And I, well, probably not polite, but I'm like, you're out of your fucking mind. I can do it. I can just, all you gotta do is call it. If you don't want to do it, I'll do it. To your credit, <clears throat> A, you always remembered it really, really well, but you also sent me a gift every year. Um, you would send me, um, like, I don't know, it was a pen. Uh, you would always send me a, a really cool gift every year that we, we did it. But so that year that we did that, we had that Peter McGill would give us this huge stage. We had that red carpet out there, like, and we had, you know, I, we had Gas Monkey out there and we had, uh, Mopar was out there. We started doing, and, and I think Magnaflow was there, but it was, it was really the power of TV. The only thing that I had on my side was you were thinking on one way and I was thinking the power of television, our brand, what Chip Foose was and what Overholland was and what we had in, on, on, as far as a hit television show was so powerful. I could call anybody. I could call Jack Roush and go, hey, Jack, I need you to show up with a trailer and an engine. And he would just say, where? I mean, we were very fortunate at that time. Um, I remember they gave me Tony Schumacher's trailer. I called Mopar and I'm like, I need a, I need a personal trailer for me so I can hold meetings. In. And then, well, how about Tony Schumacher's trailer? Okay. Can I smoke cigars in it? Do you remember that? <laughs> like, you know, like, I don't know why I was smoking. I'd like to smoke some, one, smoke one cigar in a, in a lifetime and it'd be in that trailer. Um, and then they just parked it right out front. So we had all, we had this huge, we took a, an empty parking lot and just dropped in uh, you know, the overhaul in studio. And now, I mean, that was a staple for three or four years. We've done it ever since, but now outside of SEMA is massive. We, we, I feel that we've created a huge landscape for people. Uh, yes. It, that outdoor area that Bud's talking about the outside front silver lot uh, is now uh, really one of the larger areas that folks populate and spend time on throughout the show. It, it really turned the SEMA show from, Ah, you know, you have, you have to get outside at least one day or one afternoon. It's like, now it's like, when you talk about the SEMA show, a lot of folks, their interpretation of it is what goes on outside. So that overhaul in studio, and you brought in folks that we really didn't have a, our arms around. Like we didn't have a, a forum with uh, global finishing solutions and their spray booths. We didn't know Calypso water gyps from Calypso <laughs> songs. Uh, there, there were folks that you had kind of in your stable um, and you mentioned Magnaflow and you mentioned Mothers and some of those longstanding folks that have always supported you. What I realized very quickly is that I was able to contact some of the folks that I had in my small little orbit. And when the, when Overholland came up or Bud Brutzman came up or TV came up, that's when I started to absorb and sense the power of TV and, and that feeling and that comfortability that you already had. I just picked up on it so all of a sudden it's like okay great um he's right there there is a magic to tv because i had been such a print warrior because that's all there really was back when i was starting up slinging print and then events became a thing but tv that was that was something and you really you were the guy largely to 
largely through overhaul. And wouldn't you say, I, I mean, I mentioned rides is one of my favorite, but, but wasn't overhaul in the one that really kind of put a stamp on the automotive uh, production that you were doing? Isn't that the marquee show? No. No? What is, bud? Rides. Rides, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to, I mean, here's the thing. When we, <clears throat> I think rides lent my, myself and my group and Steve V, my director, and everybody, rides, rides lent us the credibility inside the, the community, right? And I yes. remember I, 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 we were so proud of our, our initial episode. I rented, the, uh, I rented the Peterson Museum. I did a whole premiere there. I paid for it myself and I had all these people there. I mean, I, you, you name it, Peach and Boris and Chip and Peter and I brought everybody there. I think Rides was a show we did on TLC it was the first production that I sold there. And the, but it's the way that we treated, the way that we treated uh, the hot rod, you know, the way that we made it look. And I, I tell Steve Coonan from the Rogers Journal this all the time, is I, I, and I talk to him. We kind of go back and forth. But I told him, I wanted the television show to look like his magazine, like we cared, like you went out there, not just like some random shot with a, with a lawn chair and, and, a, and a car in the background. No, no. It, it has to be a piece of art. So when we did the, we did the ride series, and then we got 10, and we, we ended up doing 58 episodes. So in the, almost like the second seasons of rides, I was doing everything I ever wanted to do inside of hot rodding. I mean, if I, if I personally wanted to go to Bonneville, I would do an episode. If I wanted to go race the Baja 1000, I would do an episode. Uh, if I wanted to go meet Jay Leno, I would do an episode with him. We had so many rides kind of afforded us to do anything and everything from a, a pure enthusiast point of view to go do. Um, Overhauling was, came out of rides, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and it was the bigger show version, the popular show version. But as a core guy, for your listeners and you and I, rides is, rides is the Bible. That thing is just like Rogers Journal. I have every episode. It's up on the shelf and somewhere in plastic. I sometimes buy two two uh, two volumes of, of Rogers Journal. I put up there because it's you can tell the thickness of the paper, the quality of the photography, the quality of the writing that that person cares about that industry. Um, and I wanted to bring that uh, with with Rise. You know, they gave me an opportunity to shoot it in high definition. I was I at dinner with John Hendricks a couple of years ago, and I asked him about this. Like, why did you pick Rise? Rise was the, what, one thing that really brought Rise over the top was it was the first show fully produced in high definition. Right, before high definition would even, was even a thing. They're like, can you do that in HD? And I'm like, yes. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what the difference was, but it was like the lenses are different, the batteries are different, uh, the tape stock was different, the formats were different. Can I do it in HD? 100%. So it was the first 100% produced show for, uh, for Discovery Channel in all in the, all HD. And it had that feel too. It had that feel that no other automotive show ever had. And I wonder if it will. And you had the celebrity uh, aspect. You had Jason Priestley on there and it was, um, it was truly a really nice production. Why did, why did rides stop? Why isn't rides <laughs> happening now? I mean, it's funny. It, people at Discovery Get Channel get mad at me. Every time I meet with Motor Trend or I meet with Discovery Channel, anybody who's in charge at that time say, you know, what, what do you want to pitch? And I go, we should bring back rides. I actually made a, made a trailer to bring back rides. Second, second episode. Let's go again. Because it's this beautiful anthology. I have no idea why. Um, we were back then, John Hendricks and Andrew Hendricks launched uh, Turbo on Tuesday nights on a, on, a, on a kind of a piggyback when they were getting ready to launch uh, an automotive channel. They did it on TLC. And when Overhaul and took off, I had rides and Overhaul, and I was producing those simultaneously for almost three years. Um, and I would, you know, again, back to my travel, I traveled about back, back and forth between the two shows. Um, I don't know why, it, you know, it lasted three or four years. I would love to bring it back. I keep on telling them we should bring it back because it is that beauty. There's so many projects that afford us. If you, I mean, I'll just tell you these, these two things. <clears throat> the first episode was on Chip Foose, right? Because I did a lot of research. Jim Holloway from Mothers brought me around. I met a bunch of hot rodders in, in LA, um, Huntington Beach. And I met with Chip and Chip, Chip and I kind of clicked. He got it. He got what we were going to do. And then he called up Jay Mays at Ford, who was the lead designer at Ford at the time, and said, hey, you know, I got this television show. I want to take a project and I want to build it for this TV show. Um, obviously, we'll talk about what Chip does inside the show. So by, by stroke of whatever, I guessed correctly. And I thought, you know, our, our, our pilot episode should be on someone, someone pretty badass. And I, I made a choice. 
So my first episode, the pilot episode, which sold the series, was on Chip Foose. And it's really to Chip's credit because he was able to kind of drag me in and he showed interest in me. And he, he was like, well, let me draw. And he did logos for me. It's just, you know, you just, get, you just get drunk with Chip's enthusiasm and who he is and his talent. So we ended up doing that one. Uh, and we did a speed bird. And we ended up at, and oddly enough, we ended up at SEMA. Uh, 2002, 2003, we ended up at SEMA. Uh, and he won the design award of the year. And then while I was at SEMA, Jay Mays pulled me aside and says, uh, I have a special project for you. So if you're going to continue the series, I want to talk to you about it. So I pushed back and I, I hit, I hit discovery channel really hard. I'm like, Hey, this thing should be a series. I have all these things lined up while, while I was at SEMA, I made up, you know, I, I wouldn't say of friends, but I got to introduce to everybody you could ever possibly imagine. I was talking to Vic Edelbrock about shows. I was talking to all these people about shows. I lined up some celebrities. I did some stuff. And so the network ended up ordering 10 more episodes. And then I called Jay and I said, hey, Jay, I'm interested in your secret project you want to work on. And he goes, well, I can't talk to you by the phone, but meet me for lunch. So I, I went and drove in LA and I met him for lunch. And he told me about this special project called Daisy and he wanted me to be a part of it. <clears throat> I said, okay. So then what happened was, and then what we ended up doing was crazy. Um, I had to put it like a security plan together because this, this project Daisy can never be let out. So actually up in Valencia at a design studio, I built an entire studio. So we shot, we edited. i had two edit suites there. I kept the cameras, the footage of that show never, left the building where we were designing the car and the network was getting mad at me because they wanted to see the episode and I tell them I can't I can't give you a rough cut the only way you can do is you can fly out here sign the NDA go to the studio and you could watch the watch the cut and give us notes but I can't I can't mail it to you I can't say because it'll it'll really if this thing goes out and and you know being me being the biggest fan on the planet of what was going on I knew how severe it would be so we decided not to do it so we started filming that episode and there all is this clay model and in walks Carol Shelby. So Carol Shelby walks in big hat. Jay Mays comes in. There's Chris Theodore. And we are ended up filming the, the version of the new Cobra 2004, 2005 Cobra. Um, and I mean, Cobra, not like Cobra Mustang, like real two seater <laughs> Cobra Mustang V10, and we went back to Detroit and watched the engine development. We watched this thing get designed and built. Uh, we, we, we rented a test track and had Carol Shelby do like 168 laps around following a camera and stuff like that. So we, our, our second episode uh, was on Carol Shelby and building the Cobra. Well, you started off small, huh? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm hanging out with Carol almost every night. We're, I mean, we became friends since then. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Carol uh, because of that build. I and mean, then we went and built the GR1 and it just, it was just a, it was, it was a magic, magical time for sure. You ever want to pinch yourself uh, when you stop for a second and realize you spent the day with Carol Shelby or you have lunch with Jay Leno and you're doing TV shows. I mean, this is pretty, pretty cool gig you got, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not into pinching myself. Maybe you're into that. I just don't really do that. <laughs> I'm trying. It, it's, you know, I I come from a small town in Wyoming. It's it's pretty interesting. I really don't. It doesn't really dawn on me until I start talking to other people who I know about it. They're like, "What did you do?" And it's, and I sound like, and I try not to talk about it um, that much because you just sound like a you just sound like a dick. You know, like, oh, the other night I was having dinner with Kel Shelby and then Jay Leno stopped by and he sat down and had a drink. I just sound like an idiot, so I don't really talk about it. Yeah, I could see where that may be awkward, but, you know, it is what you do. And, uh, you know, at some point, I get the sense that those guys may be saying the same thing when they're home. It's like, I just had dinner with uh, Bud Brutzman, you know? <laughs> I seriously doubt it. <laughs> well, for those of us who have had the chance to watch you do your thing, um, you know, you do do a good job, Bud, and there's no denying that. Um, why, why are you the go-to guy when people want to do television in the automotive industry? What, what is it about you that everybody seems to want to get a piece of? Well, I have a really good team. I have a really good team of directors and, and, and people. I really, you know, it has to do with the deal making. Um, and at the end of the day, the truth is I'm a car guy, right? And I care. I know what cars and what it, what it takes. I know how to build them. I collect them. I race them. I beat them up. I wreck them. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I don't collect stamps and I don't collect toys. I wouldn't do a good job, you know, being a, you know, a toy hunter show, but I really might, I have a big sweet spot and that's, you know, power and speed and gasoline. Um, when people want to come to me, I, there's, there's an interesting shorthand when Corvette wants to call me and they, they want to do something on the C6 R and, and we want to go do it. I do it. I mean, I've, I've, I've shot, raced, drove and developed cars that we all grew up as kids, you know, the Boss 302 and the C6R. And, you know, uh, I was fortunate to be on the, the Raptor development team and I raced the Raptor in 2008 and did a documentary on it with Ford. And we could do all this amazing stuff. It's just because my style is I immerse myself in the culture, right? I just don't, I don't pop in like a Hollywood asshole and go, oh, well, you know, here I get to do this and this and I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I really have to learn learn what the culture is. And that's why I involve myself with SEMA. I'm fortunate to be, you know, doing a lot of stuff with SEMA. Uh, and now I'm doing a lot of stuff with Bonnier. I, I don't know. I, you know, there's other people that do automotive stuff, but we just do it better. You know, the thing that I noticed, Bud, is that uh, when you are involved in projects, most of them are spirited around a television production, uh, whether it's a studio on site or filming or coordinating and promotions. But you are also that guy that if there's a logistic issue, you jump right in the logistic issues. If there's an issue with drayage or with audio or with housing, uh, you don't just take on the task of the television production. When you jump into a project, particularly the logistics, which are nightmares. In fact, I've never seen a guy really adapt so quickly and figure things out as quickly as Peter than you. And there was an interesting dynamic that I used to enjoy seeing, which did include these ideas that Peter would have or a client would have an idea about doing something. And often he would just call you first. And there was never a battle of the heads, although I'm sure at some point you guys may have had differing views, but you guys seem to work in unison always. And when Bud and Peter were on something, it was pretty much in good hands. I, I never had any hesitancy when, when, when they talked about doing the score function out in front of the South Hall. We had tried so many different things there before, you know, and when you were going to do something there and then didn't even have like qualifying there. I mean, the things that you were able to ultimately do, I think came largely on the fact that when you decided to do something, it happened. Um, that's got to be a little gratifying for you too, knowing that folks, when they give you the keys to the place, they're not checking up on you. They, they know that the place is going to get handled. Well, there's a lot to, there's a lot to unwrap there. Um, <clears throat> let me start here. Technically, people only hang out with me because I do TV. Like no one would let, no one would put up my shit if I didn't do TV. So I always have TV. I always have media in the front of what I'm doing, right? And what a producer does is handle logistics. That if and people don't know what a producer does, right? So we have to figure out from talent to airfare to food. It, it's it's like being the general, not putting myself in the military position because I'm not in the military. But you you have to oversee everything. You know, like you a have conductor. To, yeah, well, you're yeah, you're a general. You're doing beans and bullets and tactics and, and and next maneuvers, and you have to kind of figure everything out and oversee it, right? And you're right. If something happens, I'll be on it because there's not a job that I that I that I can't do, and there's not a job that I haven't done before because we all start someplace, and I've ran my entire set, I've shot my own shows, I've done all my own stuff. But the key to that is having people like Peter McGilvey around you who pushes you to be better, right? Every time that I, Peter and I would sit down and we'd always, always go to some ridiculously expensive place. Sometimes I paid for, sometimes he pays for, I can't, I'm not sure if I'm keeping track. Anyhow, mostly, he pays. mostly he pays. Yes. Okay. That's your story. So, <laughs> I, mean, I think I pay sometimes, but it doesn't matter. I enjoy it. And we write, we draw on a napkin. Our thing is we draw either on the tablecloth, we've drawn on the tablecloth of whatever random expensive restaurant we're at. And we'll take the tablecloth. Um, or we draw on a piece of paper, whatever our, our idea is. But Peter always pushes me to do stuff bigger, right? And I, I'll, I'll give you the example. The score Baja 1000 was, you know, uh, was really him. Um, and him not accepting mediocrity for me, right? And I get it. And I, and, and I don't even ask him about that anymore. You got to remember that, you know, you should see what we, what we plan for Ignite. Uh, when, we, we did, when we did Ignite, when we did that planning, it was crazy. Um, so I, I went to him, you know, a, a really close friend of mine, Roger Norman bought score from another close friend of mine, Sal Fish, 2012, 2013. 
And I came to Peter and I said, hey, I want to put some, give me a lobby spot and put some trophy trucks on display. I want to start promoting what we're doing. And he told me, no, it's like, I'm not interested. And I'm like, I didn't understand. Like Peter, you know, we we're bros. We, we've been the battle together. And like, no, that, 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 that doesn't, that sounds terrible. You gotta do something better. And literally I didn't, we didn't display that year. Like I went back to my, went back to my other friend. I was like, Roger, I couldn't get you in the SEMA. Like, holy <laughs> shit. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's like so deflated. So then I sat, um, I sat and drew up and I went back to him, which was bigger than he wanted. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And then that year I was doing the Optima Ultimate Streetcar event and we had all of our cars parked there. So then I developed this Baja 1000 area that had all the trophy trucks up on a big gigantic dirt burn. So I had all vintage trophy trucks and trophy trucks were in there. And then we were going to go out on Las Vegas Boulevard. <clears throat> said I set up a track, a three and a half mile track at Las Vegas Speedway, which was through my friend Nason. And we were going to do the qualify, convince my partner we were going to do qualifying for the Baja 1000 at SEMA. That way be people who have never seen one of these thousand horsepower, million dollar dragging, you know, dragons, get to feel them, touch them, hear them. Smell them. Smell them. <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing. The fun thing about logistics. So, uh, you know, I'll finish the story. So when I came to Peter and I said, I'm going to do this, I want to do the qualifying there. He's like, yep, that's the idea. That works. That's much bigger. Static display, not interested. He pushed, there's people like, there's a lot of people like that, but you need those mentors in your life. You need those people who are going to push you to be better, right? Because because everybody can come up to SEMA, uh, to, to anybody at SEMA and go, hey, I want to put these two spike, you know, static displays on, on display and do some cool stuff for my business. Well, that doesn't help SEMA. It also doesn't help the people at SEMA. Our job as experiential marketers, you know, mine and yours and Peter's at the time, is, is to make that show interactive and tactile and feel it. So, uh, Peter always pushes me to do that. And then um, the last part about logistics was Peter always had, there was always Chuck Swartz. If you remember Chuck Swartz, who used to run the SEMA show, right? The operations, he would always come to me and they would hit, they would yell and scream at me and tell me that I can't paint a car in the parking lot. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to get a paint booth. I'm going to build it from scratch. I'm going to bring propane in. We'll get a certificate from the fire marshal. And we'll build it right here. Like, I promise you, there was a guy named Les, Les from AFC, who's amazing. I call him, I say, Les, you know, how are these things built? And I start looking at them and I start looking at his thing. I'm like, yeah, I bet you we could, how long will it take you to build? Oh, three days. It's like, well, could you build one in three days on this parking lot? And then I'll pump in propane and we can, he goes, yeah, we could do that. You give me an electrical drop and bring some gigantic propane. So then I told Peter, we're going to be painting the car on site. And, and Chuck Swartz's head came off. He's running around his little run, his little, little car like, you can't do that. You're going, to, you're going to kill everybody. And now you go to any convention, there's two or three paint. I mean, 3M has a paint job or a paint booth. And DuPont has a paint booth. Everybody magically has a paint booth, right? So, you know, it's, it's interesting for me is that we, we constantly push the boundaries, always. You know, one thing that always stuck me was uh, when I was growing up is that there was no such thing as a four minute mile until one guy did it. Like it was impossible. And then one guy did it. And now more people can do it. It's like, if it's possible, like, if that guy can do it. It's like, it's, it's, it's really the mindset. You know, you, you set these roadblocks in your brain that stuff can't be done because someone else didn't do it, but you can do it. I mean, all you gotta do is think, yeah, if you're just telling me no, because you want to be an asshole, then I, you know, I can't help you. I'll go around you, but anything's possible. You've proven that, uh, time and time again and you know there there were a lot of doctor knows especially when it comes to big events where everybody feels a sense of ownership and heritage and this is how we do it and this is what we can do and we don't do that yes um changing the course and changing the nose into yeses has really been what's made the show so much of uh, what it is now it's those it's doing those things that just wasn't a static booth and just having exhibitors. It was the interaction. Do you look back at the SEMA show now um, and remember back 10 years ago when Overhaul and Studio just popped up there and remember when, you know, Barry used to have his own stage doing his own thing and then expanding the, not only the location, but the involvement with that McGuire stage now where everybody's vying to get up there and then Shell's got a studio and then eBay's got a studio. To your point, a lot of the things that you did were new and now everybody's doing them. That's got to put a smile on your face, huh? 
it's fun. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fun to be a pioneer. I mean, Barry's stage was awesome. When I, I started doing Barry's show, we wanted to make it interactive. We wanted a movie. We built those things. Uh, it's funny. It, it's funny to hear these things live beyond just like a random sketch. Like I remember very clearly when I was doing the over the, uh, the car crazy stage, I drew these things on a, on a napkin, not kidding. It was a Pasadena probably the four seasons or I drew things on a napkin. Um, and Peter went and had them made and they're called Titanics now. Right. So everybody at Freeman and everybody at SEMA, just they think they call these things Titanics. And basically they're a huge ramp with a platform that you cover in duvetine and you display a car. Well, I needed one to go up, a huge platform, one to go down because I wanted cars moving on car crazy. Right. And then two years later, you fast forward and all of a sudden on Fridays, Barry was dark. So we took over the stage. We started doing Battle of the Builders from the same stage. So we had 12 cars out there and Battle of the Builders. So moving cars and people get to see cars and display cars. But it's always funny when I hear uh, someone talk, refer to one of the Titanic ramps that I, that I built <laughs> and then Peter went and had made and now they're just a staple. Like, oh, I'll move that Titanic over there. But uh, when you look at the uh, state of the current crop of television shows that are out there. Most of them run largely on the Motor Trend channel. Uh, what did you take on some of the outside of overhaul and return and maybe some of the shows uh, that you were a part of? What do you think about like the Street Outlaws and the Fast and Louds? Uh, do they still do it for you? Do they ever do it for you? Do you think that formula is here to stay? Do we need something different? Because personally, like I watched Fast and Loud last night. I watched... Um, uh, maybe two other recent episodes and they're, they're just starting to get a little bit old to me. Uh, is it just me? Uh, it could be just you. No, just kidding. Um, you know, it's just, no, it, <laughs> for me, for me, it's, those are different types of shows, right? The Tuttles is not, the, the Tuttles build motorcycles. Let me just do it this way. The Tuttles, they build motorcycle, but it's, it's really more drama back and forth. They want to build a drama. We in overhauling or rides or anything like, I don't do housewife drama, right? Uh, they tried early on, I won't mention his name, but we had an executive try early on and they wanted, you know, Chip to get angry and throw a wrench and fire people. And Chip would just never do that. It's just not how it is. I mean, you go to any shop in America and if you got guys firing people and screaming and yelling and, and cursing, you know, there are that, 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 that type of drama Sure, people like, yeah, Mikey always screws up. Just like, you know, you look at that formula, you know, Chumley always breaks something. It's, it's, a, it's a formula and it's a television formula. It's very popular. It's just not something I do. Um, what we do is a lot different. We pay attention. If you pay attention, the real drama, the real drama that you can identify with, which is like you broke a chain and now I'm in your world, like you broke a chain and now no one ever makes that chain. So now you have to go search the end of the earth to find it. You know, there, uh, there are certain things that happen, you know, there's delays in paint, something happens to the motor, you blow the motor up. I mean, if we pay attention inside the show when we're, when we're doing it normally, um, you create the drama. We also have a deadline, you know, uh, overhaul and didn't need all that because we were doing something good for somebody deserving, but we were racing the clock to it. Right. And for those of us, who have built stuff and built cars, they literally think it's impossible to do it in that amount of time. And it doesn't matter if it was seven days and early, you know, probably the first 100, the, probably the first 80 or 90 episodes, or when we did them in two weeks, a little bit slower pace because we were, you know, living on set. Um, it's still, a, you know, a, a lot of time, a heck of a lot of time, 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 hours, you know, it's crazy. What's going to be different with uh, the new overhauling? Uh, anything? Is it uh, pretty much going to follow suit with what we're used to? Any, anything you can share? Well, yeah. In the, in the new overhaul, you know, we got greenlit for another season uh, to help launch the Motor Trend app. And Alex Whalen and the guys at, uh, at Motor Trend, you know, came to Chip and I and said, hey, can we do it? Uh, the one thing that we did do, uh, because we want to do a new audience, is, and you'll see it tonight, there's a new episode on tonight, it's, it's on the Linear channel on, on television, but you can watch all the episodes streaming on the Motor Trend app, is we ended up doing a lot of modern cars, right? We did 2014, 2015 Mustangs, we did 2012 Raptors, uh, we did a Lightning. Um, we, we ended up trying to do, because, I mean, if you look at it, and some of it's budget and the other thing is just you know people get burned out working on a car for so long uh i have something interesting to show you so we you know if we did out of the 12 episodes you know we probably did almost 
yeah, 10 of them were more modern cars. And some people were disappointed about that, but that's really where the market's going. I mean, and, and for us, it didn't make it any better. It didn't make it any worse. It made it actually better. You get to see what, you know, what is Chip going to do? And what's he going to do to this Challenger? What's he going to do to this Mustang? We did actually a couple of Mustangs with the Shelby and we did another one. Or how, what's Chip take on a Raptor? And a lot of it's parts, a lot of it's fabrication. And then for our last episode, I'm going to show you something cool. Our last episode, um, which was, yeah, our last episode, we decided, you know, I sat down with the team. There was a lot of people going online saying, hey, how come you guys don't do old school? Wish you guys go back to old school. We ended up doing a, a 1964 Impala for Shaquille. Oh. Yeah, do you want to see it? Here, I'll show it to you. Yeah, I'll show it to you. So we did a 1964 Impala for Shaquille O'Neal. And it just happens to be right. I <laughs> <laughs> love it. So that's got a, an LS3 motor in it. It's got a roadster stop chassis. Chip redid the wheels. Uh, we had brand new interior. Uh, the guys from Arc Audio did the stereo system. But yeah, this is Shaq's car that's going to go back to him. Uh, I, I'm, he's moving and I'm holding him, just holding him for about a week because he, he lives out by me. I yeah. love, the, love the color combination, but is that like, a, looks like that agate gray Porsche with that uh, beautiful, is that like a burgundy interior? Yep. It's kind of nice. crazy. Uh, yeah. You know, Shaq has, um, Shaq's always been a strong advocate of automotive. I remember his roots back working with Ryan at West Coast Customs. We all know the stories there, but uh, he was big in the SUVs. It's nice to see him in a, a drop top. Uh, Chevy there that, that'd be that'd be quite the sight to see Shaq cruising down uh, what the 405 uh, the, the amount of, and you will the amount of fabrication we had to do and that we actually brought a, a friend of ours uh, you know Optima Jim Jim McElvey oh sure he's seven foot one and he used the guard shack so we flew him in just so we could fit him in the car we actually dropped we had to drop the pan you'll, you'll see it in the episode but we had to drop the pan we cut the bottom of the dash we dropped the foot well about three or four inches because the guy's foot is like 16, 17. Yeah, I was going to say a 17, I think. So, no, it's a size 23, but it's, oh seven, my God. it's a size 23. His shoe's a size 23, which is massive, massive. And so if he puts his foot up like this, it can't, it can't fit under the dash. So we modify the car, spread the pedals out because his feet are so wide, and spread the pedals out. We had a whole assembly. We dropped the, uh, the whole tray in the bottom, the floor pan down. Had to, had to modify and separate everything. The roadster shop helped us with the, with the chassis. So um, slid everything back, extended the column. So he should fit in that car. I mean, he did. You, yeah, I mean, he fit in the car. He said the best car he ever had. So you've got to watch the episode. You can watch it on, the, on Motor Trend. It's a real car. I mean, that car is pretty badass. Yeah, I, um, I don't doubt that for a second. I have had um, a chance to see some of these quote-unquote celebrity cars and most of them are just like lipstick and makeup. It's nice when you see a, a real car built for these guys because you would expect them to not only have the interest, but to have the, the wallet to be able to get that work done. Uh, we talked about the return of some of the vehicles from Saudi. Uh, you mentioned how much you liked your Trans Am. Talk a little bit about that Trans Am, uh, but I had a chance to see it. Is that a 77? Uh, 78. Okay. Talk a little bit about that. Was that AJ's vehicle? No, she has a 68. Hers is a 68. It's no, okay. 68. Um, no, that one's mine. I did a deal. So uh, a very close friend of mine, Kevin King, who's the president of year one, he and I did a deal, uh, you know, how long ago was it? Eight or nine years ago, 10 years ago with Burt Reynolds. So Burt Reynolds, uh, his manager was a friend of mine. And he called me and asked me, you know, Burt wants to do a license deal on some cars and put these cars out. So uh, Bert and I flew to uh, Georgia and we met with uh, Kevin King and we started to put out a limited edition uh, bandit cars. And what's interesting as a hot rodder, which made it very hard for me in Saudi Arabia to talk to you guys about this is, you know, what, what we ended up doing is, especially this one, this is a, a bandit three. It's got a new urethane front end. It's got different molded T tops because those are all notoriously leaked. It's, yes. It's got an LS nine with a new cam in it. And it sounds like an Indy car. All new, all new Detroit speed engineering suspension, brand new wheels, brand new interior. Uh, the thing is, it drives like a Corvette. It's so massive. So the one I have here, uh, it was sitting in my in my collection. I'll show it to you. Was uh, was on the cover of Hot Rod magazine. This is the one that had. Uh, if we had like Kevin had a warehouse shot with like fourteen or fifteen cases of beer. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's the. Oh band. yeah. 
I had a 78 with an anemic 403 Oldsmobile engine, but I still thought I was somebody. What, what an iconic vehicle. And oh. now, um, now where there, uh, there's a, a resurgence. I, I saw a formula, just a stock formula. Oh, yeah. Uh, with 67,000 original miles that I was drooling over. It's funny how that car um, just continues to be so sought after. What will you do with that car, bud? What will I do with it? Yeah. Pet just, it, drive it, cruise yeah. it. I mean, uh, you know, you know I, I reluctantly uh, I reluctantly was going to sell it in Saudi Arabia, all the cars that you went there, because you, you had this, they had this fear that when you go there, the Saudis were going to snatch these cars up, so you had to price them. And I reluctantly, I'm like, Ugh. okay, so I, out of all my cars, I brought that one. Thank God it didn't sell, because I fell in love with it again when it was there. And I fell in love with it again when people were asking me about it. Now they got it here, and I got all the fingerprints off it. Um, I drive it, and it's, it's amazing. You know, Kevin King at year one built amazing cars. He, I have three cars from him, my black and Mustang, and uh, my AJ's uh, uh, 68 Firebird. Yeah, that one. And it's signed by Bert. This is the one that Bert drove. Um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's just, you know, it's when you, when you grow up, you wish you had a car on the cover of Hot Rod Magazine, right? Wasn't that one of the dreams in your life? It's like you could own a car that was on the cover of Hot Rod Magazine. And I, I sometimes forget about that kind of stuff, but uh, it's a pretty important thing. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Daytona around the time of those Trans Ams and smoking the bandit was uh the hottest thing out there. And I got my hands on one. And as I look back at my time, I was definitely in over my head. I don't know how I was able to afford it or keep it, but we had some great times. And I guess that's the beauty of it. When you see those cars, it takes you back to that time uh, when you remember all those good memories. I wanted to, you know, an hour has gone by really quick and somebody with so many great stories like you, I can go on forever, but I know you've got some things to do. Before I leave, I want to see if I could just get a little bit of a sense of your feeling on a, a few things and a few folks. Maybe you could just put together a brief little response. We talked about some guys that you have worked with in the industry. Uh, give me a, a one word take on, on chip. Would you? <laughs> Good. I thought it was going to be, uh, listen, chip is one of my closest friends and chips an ab absolute genius. Um, you know, him and I have, we've spent, we've, the, the amount of stuff that we have done in the past 18 years is amazing. I mean, our careers have really kind of, you know, paralleled each other, what, what we're doing. So we're the closest friends. He's a superstar talent. Um, you know, we, I look forward to doing more stuff with him. I mean, I wish, I wish everybody would get a chance to meet him and know him and understand how genuine he is, but he's just a, an amazing guy and a good friend. We talked about Peter. What about Peter Mack? Peter McGilvery, <laughs> again, has uh, is we've already talked about. He's a mentor of mine. He always pushes to me be, be to me to be better, um, and I think we always need those people around you to be that mentor. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff that we do is because of Peter and for Peter. So Peter's a very close friend of mine and also a mentor. One of the newest inductees into the SEMA Hall of Fame this year will be Joe St. Lawrence. Uh, Joe, who had his time and one is, was one of the true, and continues to be one of the true good guys in the industry. Uh, what are your recollections about Joe St. Lawrence, particularly in light of the commonality with the television production on, on your side and his? You know, Joe's a very good friend of mine. We, we, did, we did a couple things together, and, and I've always, he is the sweetest guy in the planet. He's so nice and so sweet. And I've always told him, like, we're not competitors, right? You know, we, we are battling to try to, you know, to get eyeballs and, and, and go out there and produce the stuff. Our, our television is always different. Right. Again, I have a, a certain style of the stuff that I want to do. Um, I don't find myself a competitor of Joe's at all. I think what he did was amazing. He built the studio. He did his, he did it right. He sold and he got out. So I think, and him and I've had a couple interactions and they've always been great. Honestly, seriously. He's just very, very sweet. Love him. Yeah. Joe took on that kind of that how to formula with the power block and here's the camshaft and here's how you lube it and here's how you yeah. install it. And uh, you never really got into the, the, the product focused style TV shows was that by design? Yeah, no idea. Cause you know, that's by design. Mine's more documentary follow doc film, uh, you know, you know, film, film version of it. Um, it's just, we want to do, you know, storytelling. If we're going to go race in Baja, um, we're going to go do uh, a 
a story about a, a famous builder. You know, I'm going to continue to do it and continue to do my craft and what we do in television. People are interested. You got the thing that gets weird to me is that, you know, people pin, you know, pigeonhole us as, you know, car guys, like you're car guys. You're really good guys. I tell stories, right? So overhauling to me is not a car show. Overhauling is a, a show about people. The car is a connected tissue, right? But it's really about a, a story about fathers and sons. Um, it's, 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 it's about, you know, stories of loved ones or people lost or doing something good for somebody. It's, it's really about human development and people. It's not just like the car standing alone. If you just went out and got a random car, didn't know who was involved, went and restored it and gave it back to nobody, the show would be useless. No, we would never be on the air. It's really the, the people, the people who involve, the, the people who are in love with that car and that car means something to them. Well, but I got to tell you that, um, you do a really good job at shining spotlights on not only people, but interests and hobbies that many of us have enjoyed over the years. Uh, I have had a lot of chances to just watch you work off to the side. I've had some fortunate instances where I was actually a part of some of the things that you worked on. Uh, you gave me my big acting break on TV. Uh, I were you a detective insurance agent? What were you? I think you were more like an insurance agent, right? Like a sleazy insurance agent trying to sell some insurance. What were you doing? Um, I remember uh, you had one of the guys call me and said, hey, bud, thinks there's an opportunity for you in an upcoming episode. I said, oh, Great. wait a minute. Yeah, you were a detective or a mobster. You were a mobster. That's right. <laughs> so I said, well, what is it that you'd like me to do? It's like, well, I need you to play a detective, actually. You know, just you got to be like, you got to be a dick. You know, just, just act yourself. You'll be great. So I, uh, I have had so much fun uh, hanging out and doing my best to try to pick up a little bit of your cool. Uh, one of the things that I have always noticed and everybody else does when they see you is the black, the black attire. You got the black backdrop. I, I couldn't have you on the podcast without at least asking the question, what's the story with the black attire and your preference for black? Um, you mentioned it earlier. It really started... Um... Early '90s, you know, really started early '90s. You know, there's a there's a thing, um, the thing in our industry called stage blacks, right? And the best way to describe describe stage blacks, uh, and it's definitely evolved since then. But stage blacks are if you're at a concert and you see a guitar tech, and all you kind of see is this floating guitar, kind of walking out, hands hands with the guy. You don't notice him. He's in the background. He's handling some really important shit because you know lead guitar is car broke, so you, he hands a new one. He walks away, right? So there's a thing called stage blacks, which just kind of blend in the background. You can get all your shit done. Nobody really notices you there, but you're you're kind of the puppet master pulling the strings, pulling the strings. So I do a lot of live television, in, including all the pay-per-views and stuff we did for King of the Cage, the cage fighting organization. So um, a lot of my wardrobe ended up becoming stage blacks because I was walking around the cage, handling stuff, I had headphones on, just I'm handling fighters and incidents and ring girls, not really handling ring girls, but handling <laughs> all the stuff I need to handle. Um, but I didn't want to stand out. If I'm sitting there in a Hawaiian shirt with a white hat on, you're going to go, who's the asshole walking around with a Hawaiian shirt? So I didn't want to be that guy. Um, so stage black became a, that became an early staple of mine. And then black is so understated. It's so powerful. And then as I started to grow my business, uh, there's, there's a, uh, this is going to get too big of a, a deep thing, but there's a, there's a, a thing that happens when you start getting into a, a larger business. There's a thing in your brain called decision fatigue. So as I started growing my wardrobe, I actually stopped wanting to decide what I was going to wear. That's not a decision. I started doing this across the board, right? On a lot of things in my life. Like I like, I'm just not that guy. It's like, oh, honey, is this blue matches this, this thing over here? Like I'm like holding things up, looking in the mirror. And usually when I get up, it's five o'clock in the morning and there's no light anyhow. So you get dressed in the dark. So, you know, you, and you show up and you got like stains on your shirt and like, so I'm not really interested in that. So it became a, an easy decision. So every single thing I own is black. My race suit was black. My fireproof underwear was black. I had a Nomex suit underneath when I raced. I had, it was all black. I don't own anything, anything that's color. Well, I have never seen you if you did. And I purposely wore my black shirt just in the spirit of things. But it's been uh, a pleasure. I uh, want you to keep on doing everything that you do, because I don't see anybody doing it much better. Um, I look forward to seeing you soon. I look forward to working with you at the upcoming SEMA show. I want to thank you for everything that you do for this industry. And I want to 
thank you for being a, a cool guy and a, a cool friend. Also want to thank some of the folks that were listening in on the podcast today. I'd like to thank uh, Brian Nextrom, uh, Rick Rollins, uh, Neil Copeman, Ranch Pratt, uh, Mike Chardis, Bill Brousseau, Fred Gurley. You remember Fred Gurley back in the day with competition engineering. Some of our friends over at uh, SEMA, uh, Kevin Mitchell, uh, Matt Hay, uh, Pro Street Hall of Famer, and many others. For those of you who um, have not had an opportunity to share this podcast, let some folks know about it if you'd like. Our next podcast is uh, a week from now. We'll be visiting with Doug Evans. Uh, Doug Evans of High Performance Advisors and uh, a name and a face that many of you are familiar with in the industry will be joining us. Hopefully a little bit later on in the month, we'll be joined by Chuck Blum, uh, former CEO and president of the SEMA show back in the day, as well as um, a few other folks, including hopefully Dave McClellan and Linda Vaughn. On behalf of myself, Joseph Bergandio, and our friends at D1 Productions, I want to thank everybody for listening to today's podcast. Once again, our guest has been Bud Brutzman, one of the coolest guys in our industry, one of the best guys you'll meet, and the man that comes up first whenever anybody has anything to talk about when it comes to automotive, television, or film. Thanks, Bud, for joining us. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you on the next podcast. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you the next time. Be safe.